Hi everyone, I'm thriller author J.F. Penn and today I'm here with Tom Harper. Hi Tom. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the show. So just a little introduction. Tom is the international best-selling author of 11 historical thrillers, including his latest Zodiac Station, which is published in the US in May 2015. So that's pretty exciting stuff. And so Tom, just to start us off, tell us a bit about how you became a full-time author. Uh, well, it was something I'd always wanted to do. Uh, I remember literally being eight years old and telling my teacher that I wanted to be an author when I grew up. And by the time I finished university, uh, I hadn't kind of shaken that idea as so I knew it was what I wanted to do. And I also knew that it was actually incredibly unlikely. Um, and because it was something I'd always been interested in, I'd read lots about it. And you see lots of articles in newspapers saying, you know, only one in a hundred people who writes a book ever gets published. And I assumed quite reasonably that I'd be one of the 99 who didn't. Um, but I left university wanting to be a writer, and I thought, right, I'll, I'll give it a go. And for about three years, I sort of didn't really give it a go. And then I got frustrated with the job I was doing. I thought, no, I'm really going to have a crack at this. And the thing I was most worried about was having the discipline, um, because I knew that prob I could figure out that the hardest thing was going to be sitting down day after day and not getting distracted with um, watching day daytime television, you know, going for a walk, going to the pub, anything. Um, I was living with a bunch of students at the time as well. So um, you have to be careful about that. And I saw an advert for a crime writing competition, which was the debut dagger competition, which is run by the Crime Writers Association. And this is one of those you know, moments that changed my life because, you know, it was just an advert in the Sunday Times one weekend. And if I hadn't bought the paper that weekend or if I had not read that section or, you know, gone in recycling, uh, I kind of shuddered to think how my life would be different because I saw this competition and it, all I wanted was the first chapter, 3,000 words, and a 500-word synopsis of a crime novel. And the deadline was two or three weeks away, and I thought, this is perfect. It's just enough time. It gives me a deadline, gives me a focus, and then uh, I can just do this almost as an exercise just to get myself in the habit um, and having something to kind of work towards. And then I'll think no more of it, but it'll at least get me in a good habit. And so I wrote a chapter... Uh, and I wrote a synopsis, and I sent them off to the competition. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't think any more of it, because obviously once you enter a competition, you really want to win the competition. Um, but I was kind of realistic about it. And then I came back from holiday, and there's this letter on my doormat, uh, postmarked Exeter, which was very interesting, because I remembered that the address I'd sent the uh, competition entry off to was in Exeter. And it turned out that I had come runner-up in the competition um which was amazing and then it turned out that actually the judges of the competition were editors and agents and they really liked it obviously and um i started getting letters from them saying we really liked your opening chapter and your synopsis can we read the rest of the book which was amazing and was way already way beyond anything that i'd ever expected would happen because i knew friends who sent off um manuscripts and just got you know piles of rejection letters you know i'd heard the stories about even jk rowling you know got 20 rejection letters or whatever it's supposed to be um so i didn't think i was going to be any different and already there are publishers wanting to see your manuscript uh, and the problem of course was that there wasn't a manuscript there was just that first chapter which i'd done kind of as an exercise so then I took a sabbatical from work. I blasted out that book as fast as I possibly could. I signed up with the agent uh, who judged the competition. And then on the back of that, she was able to sell the book uh, very quickly uh, once I'd actually finished it. So it was all very fast. And it's one of the real sort of good luck stories in publishing. You hear all the bad luck stories about, um, I say, the J.K. Rowlings or um, the William Goldings of this world uh, who get all these reactions. And uh, yeah, mine was uh, just ridiculously easy in, in a bizarre way. Dream story. Well, and you mentioned that you took a sabbatical from work. What did you used to work at? Uh, I worked for an actuarial consultancy. Uh, which was a really boring job, um, but quite an interesting company because the company, when I joined them out of university, they had about 30 employees. And uh, over the three years, that grew to about 700 employees. Uh, so the company was really interesting to work for because you, you're part of something that's kind of growing and changing all the time. And then when they kind of plateaued out, when they hit kind of maximum size and you're, all you're left to do is the work, then suddenly you look around and you think, actually, this work is incredibly boring. 
Um, and it was at that point that I decided I was going to better have another crack at the writing. Yeah. It's funny how many thriller writers come from quite boring jobs. I also, you know, as an IT consultant in a previous life, mm. I think we escape in the, in this way. So yeah. <laughs> by reading these books. But tell us a bit about Zodiac Station, you know, a bit about the story and, and the type of readers who might enjoy it. Yeah, well, Zodiac Station is, is very different to all my other books, but it's a, which all my other books have had some kind of historical angle to them. And Zodiac Station is a pure contemporary thriller set in the Arctic, set on the fictional island of Utgard, which is, um, if you go to Svalbard and then you go up and right a bit, that's where it would be uh, if, it, if it existed. And it's this completely deserted uh, island um, in the high Arctic. And the only uh, population there is this research base with um, a dozen scientists in it. And the Zodiac Station is uh, the story of a, um, a guy in his early 30s, I guess, who um, has had a scientific career and then lost it in a scandal. And he sort of missed his chance, really. And then he gets this sort of second chance where his old PhD supervisor calls him up and says, come to Zodiac Station. I need you to help me with something. Uh, and he goes up there. And the day he arrives... Uh, his PhD supervisor, uh, a guy called Hagger, uh, has gone missing uh, and is subsequently discovered dead, um, as you do, at the bottom of a crevasse. And so it's his story of trying to uh, discover what happened to his PhD supervisor um, because the the top brass at the base want to say, oh, it's just an accident, these things happen, but actually, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, there's, there's a bit more to it than that. And it's sort of... Uh, it's. I think it would appeal to, um, I mean, anyone, there's a sort of, I think there's a whole genre of kind of Arctic thrillers. There's people, and I'm one of them, who just love kind of ice and snow and cold and these really wild places. Um, and that was, for me, part of the appeal of the book was writing about that sort of place. So, um, I mean, people like Alistair MacLean, those kind of old school um, thrillers. And James Rollins has one. That's yeah, like, that's right. Antarctic. Yeah, I think there's like a polar. That's it. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, and, I mean, Dan Brown, um, one of his early books was, uh, I think, I think it's the Arctic. Um, yeah. I can never remember. They're, you know, white. Jeremy yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ice, ice cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, all that. So, yeah, I think, I think most of us end up going there at some point or another because it's just such an amazing place to write about. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. You, there is a line in Zodiac Station, which I noted, in the voice of your main character. Mm. For as long as I can remember, I've dreamed of the North. And so I thought that sounded like it came directly from you. From you. Yeah, I'm, I was really amused you picked up on that because that is exactly for me. I mean, obviously, one of the pleasures of writing is you get to put all sorts of thoughts that you don't actually think in your character's mouths. But that one is straight from the heart. Uh, and that is me um, completely putting my view in my character's mouth. Um, because, yeah, it's just one of these things where, uh, as long as I can remember, um, I love snow, I love ice, I love winter. Um, and I... Do you think that's because you're a redhead and, you, you know, you don't like the sun? Yes, probably. Yeah, it's probably trying to get as far away from any kind of vitamin D as possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's because it's... It's such an otherworldly place. It's, it's um, I think it's as far, as far as you can get off the planet while still being on the planet, if that makes sense. And um, I think, again, if you're a writer, I think you sort of um, you're naturally drawn to these places um, that are kind of otherworldly because for me, the the joy of the writing and the reading. Uh, these sorts of books is being taken away from kind of normal life and I'd say the Arctic is about as far from normal life as you can get while still remaining uh, on planet earth. Mm. Well tell us about the research because I've seen a picture of you in <laughs> in the hood. As oh yes yes and a, a snowmobile helmet and all the rest of it yeah uh, yeah so the, for the research I, I mean every, every book I write I visit the places I'm writing about and that I find it actually very difficult to write about a place I haven't been to so obviously when I started doing Zodiac Station I knew I was going to have to go and visit the Arctic, which was absolutely fine with me. That was obviously one of the attractions of being able to do the book. Yeah, basically, yeah, if, if, if I'm honest. Yeah, that was, that was it. Um, and then I came up with the story afterwards. Uh, yeah, so I went to um, Svalbard, which is this archipelago that belongs to Norway um, that's about 800 kilometres north of continental Norway. Um, it's on the same latitude as northern Greenland. It's about as close as you can get to the North Pole without actually having to put on skis. 
and it's this amazing um, set of islands, about four main islands, uh, with a landmass, the, the area of Ireland, um, but and a population of something like two and a half thousand people, maybe two thousand people. I think their slogan is two and a half thousand people, three thousand polar bears. Um, that's the kind of the population of the islands. And uh, there's one main town there, which was originally a coal mining town and is now uh, turning to tourism. Um, and so I based myself there and from there took um, various kind of snowmobile trips and um, snowshoeing trips. We went up glaciers, um, kind of went into a glacier cave, which was incredible. Sort of cr you're on your belly um, with about this much space between your back and the roof. And the roof is, you know, like 30 meters of solid ice. And you're know, just thinking, and you know, I know, I knew from my research that a glacier is always moving. A glacier is not solid. It's kind of a river of ice. So you're kind of thinking, okay, so this is going to move. Um, I just hope I'm not, you know, <laughs> under it uh, when it starts to move. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, we went on this long snowmobile, sort of driving across sea ice, and uh, we got lost in a whiteout, which was uh, pretty scary, actually. Um, when uh, I was with, with a guide and with a group, uh, and when the guide says, mm, uh, I can't see the tracks of um, the guy who's leading the way, I'm like, okay, that's a problem because you cannot see you know, your hand in front of your face. It's just cloud and snow and more snow and ice and. Um, yeah, and all those all those experiences went straight into the book. Wow, that sounds very cool. I must say, like I love the idea of it, but I don't really like being that cold. <laughs> right, <laughs> it looks way too cold. I think YouTube is really good for researching places you don't want to go. <laughs> yes, yes, I'd agree with that. Um, also, Google Maps, of course, as well. Um, on Google Earth. I mean, I'm always interested. Now, uh, I interview a lot of thriller authors and I always say, so, you know, are you a thrilling thriller author? And <laughs> mm. most people are quite boring, but you're actually quite thrilling. Sorry, that's my cat. cat. <laughs> yes. Cat yes, that's my stumped cat. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are the other thrilling and kind of exciting things you've done for research for your book? Yeah, I mean, I think personally, I would have to admit to being probably at the less thrilling end of the spectrum. And I think that's fine, because actually, you know, it's my job just to sit um, in front of a computer day after day after day, writing the stories that are going to be thrilling. Um, and so it's one of these sort of um, paradoxical things that in order to write a thrilling book, you have to lead, for at least for kind of months at a time, a very unthrilling life. Uh, but in between, there are these bits that are just brilliant and which are thrilling. So the next book, which is called Black River, which comes out in the UK in September, is about a group of treasure hunters going up um, an uncharted tributary of the Amazon looking for a lost city. Um, and so obviously I had to go up, uh, well, it was, it was a chartered tributary of the Amazon, obviously, um, but a tributary of the Amazon um, looking for... Um, for actually these um, petroglyphs with these rock carvings that uh, are just on this ginormous lump of rock in the middle of the Peruvian jungle. Um, and no one knows who put them there or what they mean. Uh, and it takes about four days just to get there. Um, and, you know, you're kind of wading through swamps and uh, portaging your boat up the, the river and, um, or, you know, ha cutting your path through the jungle and stuff. It's just incredible. Uh, so that was definitely the highlight um, of, the, I say, the next book. Um, and that was one of those moments where every so often you just have to stop and look around and think, yes, I am really doing this. This is me and I'm here. Um, Very cool. And a long yeah. way from the Arctic. I mean, yes, I mean, yes. A lot of bugs as well. Yeah, this is the thing. I, I, um, you know, I had to go out and buy a whole new wardrobe when I went to the Arctic, all kind of uh, heavy coats and merino long johns and all the rest of it. And then I had to go back to the same shop and buy all the kind of summer weight stuff when I went to Peru and all the kind of you know mosquito repellent impregnated shirts and um, factor 100 sunscreen and 100% DEET bug repellent and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, it was kind of uh, opposite extremes. Well, wow, that's really funny. I mean, I, I'm I'm also an author who decides on a location that mm. I write about, goes there, and then writes a book. I mean, it, it, it's such a great way to come up with ideas because you find the story, don't you, when you're there? Yeah, exactly. And I think that certainly for me, um, the excitement for me comes from finding out new stuff. And some of that's historical stuff, but a lot of it is kind of geographical stuff and about new places and uh, the cultures and the people and the um, landscapes that you have there. Um, and 
learning that stuff I find incredibly exciting. And it's that excitement then that I'm trying to put into the book. Um, and if it's exciting for me, then it's going to be exciting for the reader. Um, and that's really what kind of fires me up. So, yeah, no, I love going to new places. And, um, yeah. And I wonder, because this happens to me, it's sort of the idea of synchronicity, that you ha have an idea and then you find out that something is actually real. Yes. You? Yes, no, it, it does happen. And, um, in fact, it happened on the Peru book, uh, as an example, where I... Read, read a lot of stuff about um, different expeditions into various jungles. And I kind of you know, thought the, the Amazon, but the Amazon is however many billions of square miles uh, of forest covering you know, 11 countries or something. Um, and you sort of read all these books and you know, I was never entirely sure where all these people were. So, and where my lost city was going to be. So eventually I had to get a big map of South America and I plotted where all the different expeditions that I'd read about, where they all were. And then I kind of thought about what my lost city would have to be like. And it's just some sort of very logical things, like it would have to have been built by civilization. So again, the kind of the real sort of lowland central Brazilian rainforest is out because um, there weren't any uh, you know, particularly advanced civilizations there that we know of. Uh, and it would have to be built of stone because obviously it's got to survive. If it's built of wood or you know, straw or reeds or whatever, it would, in a, you know, in a rainforest, it's just going to disappear. Um, and that meant, and you know, most of the Amazon basin, uh, you know, there's no stone at all because it's all just kind of um, earth and trees. Uh, and so that means that you basically have to put it up against the Andes and it's going to be kind of some kind of Inca or proto-Inca kind of civilization that's built it. And almost the moment I did that, I discovered there is indeed a legend of a particular lost city called Paititi, uh, which I'd never, ever heard of before, which is supposed to be in exactly the place that I decided it should be. Um, again, based on kind of Incas who'd come down from the mountains after the Spanish conquest. Um, and... It was, as I say, it was literally having drawn a map of where I thought a lost city should be based on kind of the requirements of my story. It turns out it's there, <laughs> as far as anyone can tell. <laughs> and that's awesome. That's exactly, you know, that does seem to happen. So, so how, how much of your books, you know, going back to Zodiac, for example, um, obviously you made up the place, but a lot of your research is for real. Um, how much of the books are like fact based uh, and how much do you make up? Um, I try to have them as fact-based as possible uh, because I've always thought that the more facts there are in a book, um, the, closer to, the closer to reality and to truth and fact it is, uh, the stronger the story is, I think, um, because the fiction is obviously, made, fiction is made up, um, and you know, you're asking the reader to suspend their disbelief. But the more that's in there that's real and the reader recognises as real, um, I think the more assurance you're giving them that the story um, is kind of plausible. And I think for me as a reader, one of the things I really love in a story, reading a book, is you know, the feeling, this could really be true. This could really have happened. Um, and particularly because having come from sort of a historical fiction background, um, where that's quite important. It's, if you're going to sell them on historical fiction, then really the historical details have to be right because they have to be that the history is correct. Um, so... Uh, that, that's where it started from but then but even with contemporary thrillers yeah so I do I try and get a lot of it as right as possible and then the fiction is just the kind of um, built on that yeah no I, I agree I, that's what I like as well and I mean you've written very widely in the sort of conspiracy mm. thriller historical thriller um, you know genre yeah the, you know apart from that kind of love of you know places and travel what are the themes that keep coming up sort of over and over again in your work yeah, I think, I mean, um, travel is one of them in that um, most of my books, Zodiac Station is quite unusual because it all take, it's quite claustrophobic. It all takes place on this one island and you can't get on or get off. Um, it's almost like a locked room mystery in that respect. All my other books have a kind of chase element where it's people moving very quickly um, from place to place, you know, often internationally. And um, so, so that's definitely been a sort of theme. And I think that's, um, I just like moving, <laughs> like, like keeping things in motion. Um, I have sort of restless, restless imagination. Yeah. Um, another thing that I realized after I'd written about, um, I don't know, eight or nine books, was that um, a lot of the people I write about, it's about the quest for perfection. Uh, people who are trying to find perfection in some way or another. And it's about the gap between um, what they're trying to achieve and what they actually achieve. Uh, so I wrote about um, the Emperor Constantine um, who's trying to achieve this kind of perfect empire. Um, I wrote about um, Gutenberg, Johann Gutenberg, 
um, who's trying to create the sort of the perfect book, the book with uh, that can be replicated perfectly um, without any kind of um, scribes messing it up and making mistakes. Um, and other people I've written about. And, uh, and I think that's and being a writer, actually. Um, when you start writing a book, you have this dream in your book, this sort of vision um, of, in your head about how perfect this book is going to be. And as you write it, it's obviously a series of kind of compromises. Um, and inevitably, it's never quite as good as that initial kind of pure dream you had. Um, but you do the best you can, uh, and then you try again and try and make it more perfect the next time. Uh, and I think a lot of people that I write about are doing the same sort of thing um, in their different fields. That's a really interesting theme. Uh, I mean, most people would, you know, with thrillers, it's kind of good versus evil. But <laughs> yes. you've gone with like a, a really quite deep and meaningful theme. <laughs> yes, well, I've got, I've got an evil too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. evil as well. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and high body count. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Although I think my, my thrillers have probably have uh, less body count than than some. Um, <laughs> I'm actually quite squeamish for a thriller writer. It's my my, my embarrassing secret. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, you mentioned kind of movement and being restless. And mm. I read, uh, were you born in Germany or you raised in Germany? And that's right. Born, born in Germany. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then around a lot as a yeah. child. Does that? I mean, yeah. you set. I mean, you're in York now, right? Yeah, set, that's right. Yeah. Or yeah. Brave movement still. Yeah, it's a, sort of odd. Uh, we've been here for ten years now, just this this year. Um, and we moved here thinking we'd be here three to five years. And obviously, um, we've been here a lot longer and have no plans to move. So, but it's very strange to me, um, not moving in a way. And um, in fact, my wife was um, approached about a job somewhere else um, a few weeks ago. Um, and I was, think, I was saying, yeah, yeah, we should, we should do this. Um, not actually because I thought it wasn't actually very good, you know, it wasn't the right job for her at all. And I didn't even want to go to that place. But it was just this sort of feeling that we ought to be moving on. We've been here too long. Surely we should go somewhere. And then you stop and think, actually, we're really happy here. Um, so maybe we shouldn't move on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I moved a lot around a lot. So I was in Germany for five years. I was in Belgium for five years. And then in America for about seven years before I came back to the UK. And, um, yeah, so this idea uh, that you, 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 you're there for a while and then you move on is kind of quite deeply ingrained. Mm, that's, that's fascinating. Now, now about York, because, mm. of course, uh, you know, a lot of the audience uh, will be in America or haven't visited. Yeah. What, what is so awesome about York from a historian's and a thriller writer's perspective? Yeah, uh, to be honest, it's probably better from a historian's perspective than a thriller writer's perspective. Um, but it is an amazing town. I mean, for, if you haven't been, you, you who are watching, um, it's a, uh, you know, it goes back to Roman times. Um, it's still got its city walls uh, intact surrounding almost the entire city, which are built on the Roman foundation, the Roman walls. And, and you get bits of the Roman walls that are still standing, um, you know, as high as when they were built. Um, and then you've got this beautiful sort of city centre that's a mix of kind of medieval, Georgian, um, Victorian and more recent. And then this incredible um, 15th century minster um, cathedral, uh, gothic, huge gothic cathedral um, in the centre of town, which is so big. In York's quite a small town. And then you've got this cathedral in it. And it is the first time I saw it, it was like an alien spaceship had landed in the middle. And you sort of saw it almost as medieval people must have seen it as this very otherworldly thing that just is beyond scale or, or comprehension. So it's an absolutely beautiful city um, with loads of uh, amazing countryside around it. Um, that's not so useful for, from, a, from a writing point of view. But what's, what's really great is the history, um, the history within York. Because as I say, it goes back to Roman times. And my favorite place in York is you can go to the Minster and you can tour what they call the Undercroft, which is basically the basement. Um, and as you go down the steps, you can see the different levels of stone because the 15th century st um, church stands on top of the Norman church, which in turn stands on top of an, a Saxon church, which in turn stands on top of the headquarters of the Roman fortress that was there. Um, and you can see the different layers of stone, one built on top of the other uh, as you go down. And to me, that's just like this beautiful, perfect metaphor um, both for history itself, um, in terms of it's not kind of um, one era finishes and, and then you're done with it and then you move on. You know, it's constant. Everything's built on one on top of the other, um, and also a great metaphor for York because, as I say, it's everything's built 
um, on the past. And you can you know do a 360 on a York Street, and you can see buildings you know built in every century from um, you know the 1500s through to the, the 21st century, and and all still in use. And that's what's so amazing. I was um, researching a book about, about the 15th century. In fact, uh, this is my Johann Gutenberg book. And I was sitting in the library in York, um, poring over this very academic book about medieval houses, because I was trying to get a sense of kind of medieval architecture. And I read this line that says, um, of course, the best preserved um, example of surviving uh, medieval row houses, which was this particular kind of house, um, is to be found on Goodrum Gate in York. I thought, OK. I sort of, you know, look up from the book, look out the window, pretty much there it is. Um, and it's got a Chinese restaurant, um, a shop selling rubber stamps um, and a jeweler's. Uh, and it's something I'd walked past a hundred times um, and never realised that it was this sort of great historically significant um, kind of thing that survived probably the best part of six or seven hundred years. Um, and that's the kind of stuff you get in York. It's just all around you and you just never quite know um, what's going to be next. Mm, I completely agree and it's one of the reasons I love being in, in England and I live in mm. England and it's just, yeah. you know, you walk around and it's like, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what I'm standing on, it's, you know, mental. Um, and I was, I was, you know, changing tack a little bit. Uh, mm. You know, we're getting serious, deep and meaningful. But mm, okay, yeah. you mm. have made a Lego trailer <laughs> for Zodiac Station, which I, yes. I believe you actually made yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, I did it with a friend of mine. Um, why, why Lego? Uh, you know, and tell us about that. Is that is that a normal part of uh, life? <laughs> uh, no. Um, in fact, it's probably best if it's not a normal part because um, you know that took me you know, quite a long time away from when I should have probably been writing the book. Uh, but it was just too much fun not to do. Um, yeah, that was just. I've got. Uh, I mean, I love film. I love uh, movies. Uh, I would like most writers. I would love to see my books turned into films. And I had a really vivid um, visual idea of kind of how Zodiac Station would look uh, as a film. Um, and you know, I w would have loved to do a kind of full-on cinematic trailer um, for the book. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, that would involve helicopters and ships and being in the Arctic, um, and would probably cost millions of pounds. So, um, and then it's just one of these things, I've got two boys who are seven and four, uh, so I'm quite uh, up on what's happening in the world of Lego. And uh, the ship, uh, the story opens with a Coast Guard icebreaker battering through um, the, the sea. And last year they released um, a Coast Guard ship set and I thought oh, that was quite interesting. So and then this year, that, obviously. which funnily enough, my son desperately wanted for Christmas. So it was like, OK, you can have that for Christmas. Um, and then um, six months later, they released a whole set of, of Arctic Lego. It's like Zodiac Station Lego. It's brilliant. It came out at the same time as the book. Um, so I bought a couple of those sets and kind of repurposed them slightly. And I've got this friend who works for a big um, visual effects company in London, um, which is hilarious, actually, because, he, you know, he does computer stuff for, you know, like Harry Potter um, and the Hunger Games and all these massive movies. But um, actually, what he really wanted to do was just like, you know, stop motion animate little Lego people. Um, so he came up uh, and between us, we sort of built these, these models and um, kind of animated them and, uh, and threw together the film. And it was just absolute blast it looked really fun and mm. I, you know, I don't have uh children or lego in my house but it made me think i need to go buy lego <laughs> <laughs> so it really is an awesome trailer and i'll link to it in the um in the show notes for this oh, that, that'd be great yeah it really is super um and of course there does seem to be uh, a trend on on youtube of lego trailers and versions of movies and i saw one of um 50 shades of gray <sighs> <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up no, because no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> worth watching. Nothing to do with thrillers or your books, obviously. Uh, indeed not. No. <laughs> so anyway, uh, shifting back to reading because I can mm. see behind you your bookshelf there, which looks looks fascinating. Who are the authors that you read for pleasure? You know, whether in the thriller genre or more widely. Yeah. Um, well, I am a big fan of John Le Carre as a kind of uh, classic kind of spy thriller. Um, I love his smiley books. Um, I really love the way, and this is something that I've tried and tried and cannot pull off. I love the way that he tells you very little and has these really obscure and oblique scenes. Um, and you really have no idea what's going on. And yet 
you're completely hooked and you have, have to know. And he manages to sort of give you just enough sense of what's going on without ever telling you. And I just, as a writer, I can't figure out how you do that. Because if I try that, um, I just get a note back from the editor saying, can't work out what's going on here. Please, can you just make it a bit clearer? And then you make it a bit clearer and the kind of the effect's lost. Um, so, yeah, that's something I'd love to crack. Um, Neil Stevenson, um, who uh, started, he's really interesting. He started out as a science fiction writer. And then he uh, turned to sort of historical fiction. He did a big book called Cryptonomicon and then an even bigger trilogy called The Baroque Cycle, which is set in the 17th century. Uh, and he writes historical fiction unlike anyone else I know. I think having come at it from a science fiction background, he's just got this really kind of anarchic, freewheeling, um, kind of swashbuckling way of writing about the history. He's actually writing about really complex stuff. He's writing about kind of... Um, the very early roots of computing and some of the um, really interesting stuff that was going on in kind of the 17th century with Isaac Newton and Leibniz. Um, and his research is absolutely top notch, but it's just not this very, so many, so much historical fiction is very worthy, um, very respectful of the past. And he's not like that at all. Um, and it's just got this tremendous energy about it. So I, I love Neil Stevenson. Um, uh, I love Dan Simmons. Uh, this is on, on the Arctic theme, who wrote um, a book called The Terror, which is kind of reimagining the last days, yeah, of the Sir John Franklin expedition, um, where they get stuck in the ice for two and a half years and they're never seen again. Um, and I thought it was an amazing book. Um, that was kind of one of those books where you finish it and think, God, I wish I'd written that. I wish I could write a book that good. Um, you kind of resent him for having written it because now you can't write it. Um, so yeah, him, uh, Robert Harris uh, as a thriller writer. Um, again, and I like both his contemporary thrillers and the historical stuff he's done, particularly with Cicero. I think those are a really good way of kind of um, turning history into thrillers, basically. Um, and and as, as a kind of more contemporary, um, Chris Ewan, I've, um, who I sort of, I met through the Grand Writers Association, but he writes these really nicely put together really beautifully written thrillers um that i just can't get enough of mm. well, there you go um did, did robert harris write the fear index that that's called? right yeah yeah which was kind of uh different to uh, many of his other books i which was you know almost like a techno thriller um, y yeah interesting yeah and um yeah, having because I think he'd done one of his Roman books before that, and then um, suddenly it's this really compact, taut, um, all about. Uh, it's not derivatives trading, but it's um, oh, yeah, it's like a trading, but a computer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's AI trading. It's yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's happening. You know, it's it is happening now. It's kind of weird. Yeah, <laughs> twist at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It is fascinating, and what I, you know, I think what what you've just done, obviously, you've you've um, and you know, you before you've written other historical books, mm. as well, right? Um, yeah, under, under a different name. Um, yeah, and so you know, you're changing themes. I mean, where do you where do you see yourself? I mean, you know, you're you've been writing for a long time, but you're still a young writer in the yeah in the game. Do you, you know what are the things that you would like to ex expand into? It's a tough question. In fact, um, I delivered um, Black River, which is the, the Peru book, um, a couple of months ago, and um, I've kind of been asking myself, kind of, you know, where do I want to go? Because I've I've been, I had a really indulgent editor who's kind of let me go all the places I want to go, um, and you know, if I say I want to. I'm that do this sort of complex time slip novel about ancient Greece, absolutely fine. Next book, I'm going to do a contemporary thriller in the Arctic. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Um, I've sort of been so many places. Um, I've slightly, I've not got a kind of strong um, kind of identity. It's not like there's a, you know, like, like Peter James who owns Brighton um, in fiction. Um, I don't have anything like that. So, I mean, it's always going to be um, inspired by history to a certain extent. Um, I think that's where so much of the um, of the inspiration comes from. That's, I did a history degree at university, um, and all my stories, with the exception of Zodiac Station. Zodiac Station almost comes from an absence of history, though, um, because I, I set out wanting to write a sort of historically based novel in the Arctic, um, but there's just so little history there because you know it's just a great big ice sheet and it spins off and melts. So actually. Um, you know, I was talking about the difficulty of having a lost city in the jungle that's gonna not going to rot. You know, in, in the um, in the Arctic, it's even worse. Because you had a lost city in the Arctic, it would just you know sp spin off into an iceberg, um, and then uh, sink. 
So, <laughs> so you just lose anything that was there anyway. Exactly, yeah. So in a sense, writing Zodiac Station as a contemporary thriller is a response to that. It's actually um, a book about, you know, an, a place where there really is no history. Mm. Which is fascinating. I mean, but what about, I mean, because when I think about that kind of historical research that you do, I, mean, mm. I think of Game of Thrones, which is really based on... on the yeah, yeah. Is that, does that, and, and Neil Stevenson, I think of as well as someone who creates like worlds too. Yeah, he does, yeah. Interest you, I mean, with your Lego side as well. <laughs> would, you, would you, you know, does that, or do you read that type of stuff? Is that interesting? Um, I read Game of Thrones and loved it. I love the TV series. I'm completely hooked on that. Um, yeah, I would, and I and I love I love it for what it does for history because actually, if you read Game of Thrones, I think you understand the Wars of the Roses so much better. Um, I certainly felt that rather than you know you read a history book about the Wars of the Roses, it's you know you can't keep track and there's you know five kings they're all called Henry or Richard um, and you can't quite. Re- understand why they're all so kind of cross with each other and what relationships are and then you read game of thrones and you really understand how tightly meshed everyone is and why everyone hates each other um so and it's actually a really interesting alternative way of studying history um and yeah i mean i would love to write a kind of an alternative history book um sort of again coming back to robert harris sort of like fatherland i guess um but um because I've sort of done explored history in, through a straight historical novel. I've done some time slip novels, which sort of take a modern story and a historical story and kind of interleave them. Um, but I think actually, as I say, alternative history um, or alternative reality. So uh, uh, writing a contemporary set novel, but it's slightly different because somewhere along the line in the recent past, something's changed. Um, I think that's a really interesting way of exploring history sort of by, by looking at it as, at a different way. Um, I don't think I would write full-on fantasy just because there are so many people who do that sort of stuff so well, and they write such enormous books. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, and I think I'd be pretty intimidated about you know, taking those guys on. Mm, no, it's, it's so interesting how history weaves into everything. So, um, Well, that's brilliant. So where can people find you and your books online? Uh, well, they can find me online uh, on all the usual places on Facebook and Twitter as Tom Harper Author. Um, and my website is uh, tom harper.co.uk. Um, or they, in the books, obviously, you can find uh, on Amazon, um, Kindle, uh, or in hard copy. And it's, as I say, it's coming out in America in May. And uh, HarperCollins are my US publisher. And hopefully they're going to make sure that it's all over the place. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Tom. That was great. Oh, thank you, Joanna. Thanks. <laughs>